Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, and in Vancouver is Matthew Stockton. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Michael. I have a bit of a runny nose. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's allergies. I don't know what it is. I'm hoping it's not the Rona, but... Maybe you were abducted and they put something up your nose, but aliens put something up your nose last night. Maybe they put something up my nose. They could have done. Yeah, we're going to talk about UFOs. I mean, you and I both have been to the gates of Area 51. We have, and ever since going there with you and seeing your fascination with UFOs, I... I've been thinking about them and, and actually reading a lot so I can like talk to you a little bit more about them. So yeah. I'm, I'm actually <laughs> inadvertently prepared for this episode. Yeah, so I am fascinated by it, but I don't think I'm one of those crazy people who say, a gray alien is going to come to me and take me away and solve all my problems. I'm not that kind of person. I, I'm just curious about what people see. Yeah, absolutely. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Patine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. First up in this episode, we'll have a look at a little more about the history of UFO sightings in Canada and elsewhere. In the show's second half, we learn about a series of UFO sightings that occurred in the 1970s in Manitoba, particularly around Carmen. The sightings garnered specific attention because of their frequency and because many credible individuals, including police officers and other professionals, witnessed them. The name Charlie Red Star was given to the object due to its bright red hue, was often described as glowing, pulsating, and sometimes changing shape. Sightings of the object frequently mentioned its ability to move at incredible speeds and make sudden maneuvers that seem beyond the capability of conventional aircraft of that era, and of this one. The phenomenon of Charlie Red Star drew many UFO enthusiasts, reporters, and investigators to the area in the hope of witnessing or gaining some understanding of the mysterious object. While there were numerous speculations and theories regarding the nature of Charlie Red Star, including secret military projects, extraterrestrial craft, or atmospheric phenomena, the true identity and nature of the objects remain unexplained. The events surrounding Charlie Red Star have since become a notable chapter in the annals of UFO lore. This is Dark Poutine, episode 289, Spooktober 3. More on Canadian UFOs and the Charlie Red Star sightings. Humanity has told stories of and written about strange things coming from the sky as long as we've been able to communicate with each other. 
In New Zealand's Maori culture, there are narratives about celestial beings who descended from the night sky playing roles in their creation stories and other cultural myths. Some indigenous Australian myths speak of sky heroes or entities that descended from the Milky Way playing a role in their creation stories. The Mayan texts from Central America speak of the teachers of the sky or celestial beings that descended from the heavens. Some interpretations of Mayan artifacts and writings suggest encounters with beings from other worlds or dimensions. The Dogon tribe in Mali, Africa has detailed knowledge of the Sirius star system specifically Sirius B, a star not visible to the naked eye. Hmm. According to their traditions, amphibious beings from Sirius, known as the Nomal, visited Earth in ancient times, providing knowledge about the cosmos. The ancient Sumerians depicted and wrote about entities known as the Anunnaki, which some theorists interpret as beings from another planet. According to specific translations of ancient cuneiform tablets, the Anunnaki were said to come from the heavens or stars. Here in North America, the Hopi of Arizona have legends of the Kachinas, spirit beings originating in the stars. They are seen as intermediaries between the humans and the gods and play an essential role in Hopi rituals and ceremonies. At a basic level, kachinas represent spirits or life forces associated with the natural world. They can embody anything from ancestors to elements, celestial bodies, animals, or even certain concepts or ideas. Kachinas are believed to reside in the San Francisco Peaks and other sacred locations near the Hopi and Pueblo regions. They are thought to visit the human realm during specific times of the year. They play essential roles in cultural ceremonies and dances, teaching societal values and ensuring order. Representations of these spirits are carved into kachina dolls, traditionally made from cottonwood root, serving as educational tools for the young. While hundreds of kachinas have various attributes and roles, commercializing their symbols, especially outside their traditional context, has sparked controversy. Isn't that the way? Everybody just wants to make a buck. The Cree, one of Canada's largest indigenous groups, have stories of the star people who visit Earth occasionally. Like many indigenous traditions, the Cree people's stories and oral traditions are rich and varied, with nuances differing between communities and regions. While direct transcriptions of these oral stories can be difficult to find out of community settings, some Cree stories about star people or similar entities have made their way into broader consciousness, often through the accounts of indigenous elders or storytellers. Some narratives describe them as benevolent beings offering knowledge, while others suggest they occasionally take humans to their star homes only to return them later, hopefully. One such story speaks of star people who visit Earth and interact with Cree, heavily paraphrased, the story follows. During a particularly harsh winter, a bright light appeared in the sky in the cold northern lands, moving in ways known to no animal or natural phenomenon. Over several nights, this bright light would come closer and closer. One night it descended, and from it emerged beings unlike any Cree had ever seen. They were the star people. These star people were described as gentle and kind. They had a luminescent quality, and their presence was soothing. The star people stayed with the Cree during that winter, teaching them various skills and sharing knowledge. One of the most important lessons they shared was about the interconnectedness of all life and the importance of living in harmony with the earth and the cosmos. As winter ended and spring approached, the star people prepared to leave. The Cree were sad but grateful for their visit. Before leaving, the star people promised they would watch over the Cree and visit again, and they urged the Cree always to remember the lessons of harmony and balance. Stories like this can be interpreted in various ways. For some, it's a spiritual or moral tale about the importance of balance, harmony, and the gifts of knowledge. For others, especially in the context of the modern UFO discourse, it's seen as recounting of an actual encounter with extraterrestrial beings. It's crucial to approach such tales respectfully, recognizing their cultural, spiritual, and historical significance. It's also essential to understand that the Cree, like other indigenous groups, do not represent a monolithic culture. Stories and beliefs might vary widely between communities and regions. 
so some of our Cree friends may be wholly unaware of star people or star beings. Yeah, I'm, I, here's my take on it, Mike. So ancient civilizations like the Sumerians and the Cree weren't primitive or ignorant like, like many people seem to believe. They actually developed sophisticated systems for understanding sort of celestial bodies movement, celestial mythos, and the systems they used that was used in like different cultures who had, had no interaction with each other worldwide. And, and I think that's for a reason. So this, this sort of like mythos of space played a real role in organizing aspects of their life on earth, like navigation, like agriculture and understanding when the moon's out, when the sun's out, when, um, uh, different, um, uh, what word am I looking for? <laughs> spring spring summer fall oh winter. different seasons <laughs> different seasons were when the seasons change <laughs> right so yeah so i think the idea that certain ancient beings like the how did you pronounce it anunnaki mm -hmm. the idea that they were actual people or extra or extraterrestrials i think is looking at it in the wrong way sort of through our 21st century's eyes right these were actually symbolic representations within the myth that the culture developed right and any sort of modern attempt to reinterpret these ancient beliefs into a world of technology and reality i think kind of does them a disservice I actually find it really interesting because you have these ancient people that were smart. Yeah. And they gave the planets human-like qualities to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And they, they knew they were symbols. Looking at sort of the Cree with these stories and understanding they were myths and understanding that they are figuring out how to ways to survive and explore and to wonder actually makes them just like us, and that's human, Yep. right? Uh, because we, we've come no further with these things. <laughs> right. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> We're still trying to figure out what it all is. Yeah, and I think my summary of, of this point is, like, you got to read or understand what they were doing and not try to put your own sort of cultural bias mm -hmm. on it. And that's what happens so much with, with these sorts of stories. Yeah. Oh, it might have been aliens. Well, actually, no, it was something much deeper. It was, it was almost religion. But what if it is aliens? <laughs> yeah, but it's not. <laughs> okay. Aliens or not, many other indigenous peoples across Canada have similar stories of things that come from the sky. European settlers to Canada saw things too. No, the sightings did not start as some media lazily reports after Roswell in 1947, or with Trinity in 1945, read UFO researcher Jacques Vallée's book on the same name for more on that. In 1792, explorers David Thompson and Andrew Davy reported an unusual incident in northern Manitoba. They claimed to have witnessed several peculiar meteors plummeting into the ice, Thompson's journal describes a night where they observed a bright spherical meteor, in quotes, that seemed larger than the moon. Upon impact with the river ice, it made a noise resembling that of jelly, shattering into countless glowing fragments before immediately vanishing. I don't know what jelly sounds like, but that's weird. However, when they inspected the site the following day, they found no trace or impact mark on the ice from the meteor. In 1872, Bathurst, New Brunswick, witnesses reported observing a strange glowing object in the night sky. This object's movement was erratic and did not conform to the behavior or appearance of any known celestial objects of the time. Over the course of several minutes, the object was seen moving in various patterns, drawing the attention of multiple residents of Bathurst. Its light was brighter than stars or known planets and exhibited a radiant glow distinct from other natural sky phenomena. At the time, explanations for such observations ranged from atmospheric anomalies to celestial events. Without the framework of modern ufology, the sighting might have been attributed to meteorological or astronomical phenomena. The incident, along with others of the era, was often documented in local papers or journals, but without the extensive follow-up or investigation that would accompany similar events in the late 20th century and now. 
1872 Bathurst sighting is occasionally cited in discussions about historical UFO sightings in Canada, offering a perspective on how such phenomena were perceived before the modern era of UFO reports. According to Chris Rutkowski's book, The Big Book of UFOs, during the First World War on February 15, 1915, headlines in the Toronto Globe warned of potential airborne raids over Canada. The stories focus particularly on Ottawa's blackout as a defense against potential bomb droppers. That night, multiple mysterious sightings occurred beginning at around 9.15 p.m. in Brockville where people, including the mayor and city officials, observed unidentified lights in the sky crossing the St. Lawrence River toward Ottawa. Subsequent reports from other areas, including Gananoki and a Toronto suburb, also spoke of unknown aircraft in the sky. Ottawa's administration, including Prime Minister Robert Borden, responded by imposing the country's first blackout, fearing an invasion, while initial reactions ranged from fear to skepticism. It was later suggested that the sightings might have been a prank involving fire balloons celebrating the end of the War of 1812. This explanation gained traction when paper balloons were found in Brockville. However, subsequent evaluations raised doubts considering the direction of the wind at the time. It just didn't match up. The following evening, Ottawa again went dark, with weaponry positioned atop buildings for defense. Many speculated that these might be American aircraft. However, investigations revealed that very few American aircraft during that period could have flown from the border to Ottawa and none could bear searchlights. These lights remained unexplained. As we know, there were many other sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena in the skies above Canada and across the country throughout the intervening years. A few, like Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia, we have already talked about on the show. Manitoba, where the Charlie Red Star incidents occurred, is renowned as a UFO hotspot, drawing attention over the years due to several key factors. The province's geographical and topographical features, such as its vast open landscapes, clear skies and minimal light pollution in rural areas, make it conducive for spotting aerial phenomena. This reputation is further bolstered by historical incidents, notably the widely publicized Falcon Lake encounter involving Stefan McCulloch in 1967, a story we covered in episode 67 of Dark Poutine. To recap, in 1967, Stan Mikulak encountered an unexplained phenomenon near Falcon Lake which became one of the most notable UFO cases due to its concrete evidence and Mikulak's detailed testimony. While prospecting on May 20th, he saw two cigar-shaped objects. One landed nearby while the other hovered. Upon closer inspection and hearing muffled voices, he attempted to communicate. Suddenly, the object emitted a blast of heat or gas, burning him through his shirt in a grid pattern. Post-encounter, Mikuluk showed symptoms resembling radiation sickness. The site later revealed radioactive metal fragments and a burn mark on the ground. Despite thorough investigations by the RCMP, the military, and UFO researchers, the event remains one of history's most compelling and unresolved UFO incidents. Manitoba's UFO enthusiasts and researchers, including notable Canadian UFO researcher Chris Rutkowski, actively document and investigate such sightings. We spoke to him in episode 219 of the show. The province's cultural fabric also weaves in tales of sky phenomena and star people, originating, as we mentioned, from the indigenous traditions of the First Nations communities, amplifying local interest. Furthermore, Manitoba's mix of urban centers like Winnipeg and numerous remote areas means that sightings might stem from unfamiliarity with aircraft or atmospheric occurrences, resulting in heightened reports. The Cold War era, marked by elevated aerial activities and tests throughout North America, could have also contributed to the UFO sightings, especially considering Manitoba's strategic location. The intertwined historical events and proactive research have heightened public awareness, making Manitobans more observant and apt to report unusual sky phenomena. This unique blend of historical, geographical, cultural, and societal elements positions Manitoba prominently on the map for UFO enthusiasts and sightings. The incidents attributed to the Charlie Red Star group of sightings began arguably in early 1974. Side note. 
While much of my research comes from books like Grant Cameron's Charlie Red Star and Chris Rutkowski's various volumes on the subject, as well as from newspaper and media reports, I found a lot about the sightings at the official Library and Archives Canada site, in particular the now-archived Canada's UFOs, The Search for the Unknown. There are official reports of UFO sightings taken by, and sometimes even reported by, RCMP and the Canadian military. While some point to February 1975 is the beginning of what has been called the Charlie Red Star series, I found other references to earlier Manitoban sightings around the end of 1974 that may or may not be related, but are worth mentioning. The sightings began between Christmas and New Year near Birch River, nearly 500 kilometers north of Carmen, where the bulk of the Charlie Red Star sightings later occurred. In an RCMP report dated the 26th of January 1975, Birch River resident Raymond Sura, 51, recounted what he'd seen in the sky in the week after Christmas. Mr. Sura said, quote, Around 6.30 in the evening, my son Barry and I were going east on a mile road near my house. I was driving my half-ton when I looked out the passenger window and saw a bright light in the sky. It looked like the headlight of a car. I told my son to look, and he did, and then it disappeared." End quote. Raymond's son Barry also gave a statement to police. He confirmed what his father claimed. Quote, Around Christmas time last year, I was out with my father in his half-ton truck. He was driving. We were around one mile east of my dad's house, and it was around 6.30 p.m. I was looking around when I spotted an unusual light in the sky in the south. After seeing this light, I turned away, and when I looked back, I saw it again, but it disappeared. End quote. Regarding its movement, Barry expressed uncertainty. He recalled an unusual sighting in B.C. that he'd had in 1967 when asked if he'd ever seen anything similar. Another family, the Heberts, also saw something in the sky on the evening of the 28th of December, 1974, near Birch River. Family matriarch Ann Hebert, 41, shared her account with RCMP Constable McDonald. She said, quote, We were driving down the road and I was with my husband and daughter. Irvin, her husband, mentioned the light and I looked out the window. I was sitting in the passenger seat in front. The light was much larger than any of the stars in the sky. I didn't take my eyes off the light until it disappeared. It appeared to have a yellowish red tinge to it. I kept watching the same spot to see if it would reappear. My husband stopped the car and got out to see if he could hear any sounds. He never heard anything. Anne's husband, Irvin, echoed what his wife had claimed. He said, quote, I was driving south on the west side of section 14125. At about the half mile, I glanced off in the southeast direction and noticed a light in the sky at an elevation of about 20 degrees. It took several seconds for me to realize that it was something unusual. I drew it to the attention of the other passengers in the car. My wife and daughter noticed it immediately. They continued to watch it, and I put my eyes back on the road for a second or two. As they watched it, it went out. The big light appeared to be 8 to 10 times as bright as the stars, or Venus, or similar to a farm light at approximately a half mile distance. The big light appeared white to me, however I'm slightly colorblind, and the color red I sometimes have trouble with. My wife and daughter said it had a reddish tinge to it. We stopped for a while, watched and listened. The sky was fairly clear with only a few scattered clouds. The stars were just barely visible, as it wasn't quite dark yet. The light didn't appear to move as we were watching it. We stayed there for possibly 10 minutes, watching and listening, then drove away very cautiously. After that, the sightings calmed until February 1975, when, for the next few months, people would see strange lights in the sky near Carmen, Manitoba, roughly 90 kilometers to the southwest of Winnipeg. More after a quick break, but first, here's the promo for Supernatural Circumstances. Hey Dark Poutine listeners, Mike here. Are you ready to dive deep into the mysteries of the supernatural? Join me and award-winning paranormal researcher Morgan Knudsen as we dissect chilling phenomena on supernatural circumstances. From spine-tingling hauntings to creepy cryptids and other paranormal subjects, we'll be your guides on this extraordinary journey. 
We're in Season 2 right now, so there are plenty of episodes for you to catch up on. Buckle up and explore the unknown with us and numerous expert guests. Download Supernatural Circumstances wherever you podcast. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. It's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts so far? Here's my belief, okay? People might think I'm a bit weird, but I'm not concerned about that. People know you're a bit weird. (laughs) When I watch the news and see wars and the lies and the struggling economy and the environmental problems and the selfishness, I think to myself, well, at least someone out there other beings out there are inevitably doing better than us. So my thought is when humanity eventually fades away, it doesn't really matter because there's lots of other lives out there. And I don't actually believe in like that there's a few planets with intelligent life. I actually believe that there are probably billions of them. Well, math math tells us that that's true. The universe is huge and it's unrealistic to think that we're the only ones. And that gives me solace, my own sort of astro theology that helps me get through life yeah the flip side of that is so i believe in intelligent life that's out there but i also don't think it's ever visited here humans deep down know we're not alone and we've created these visitation myths but the universe is so immense that it's probably too far away to reach us or even know that we're here here's a challenge for that line of thinking i'm just speculating i'm not saying i know something There may be civilizations that are so much further advanced than we are that they can bend space, time, and travel over vast distances almost instantaneously. I think that even the smartest ones out there probably can't. But that's not to say that it doesn't matter. You know, we're alone. We probably always will be. But knowing that they're out there just is enough for me. It warms my heart. There you go. (laughs) Charlie Redstar, a bright reddish-orange UFO sometimes accompanied by friends, is likely the most witnessed in Canadian history, having been observed by hundreds around Carmen, Manitoba, over several months. According to Chris Rutkowski, in February 1975, a farmer near Lundar, 115 kilometers north of Carmen, was on his way to a barn when a light about the size of a basketball descended over him. As he looked up in shock at the entity, it felt like molten plastic had been draped over his face. He described feeling choked and disoriented under its presence. The incident might have marked the initial appearance of Charlie Redstar, and Rutkowski called it a flap. When I saw this, I was like, what are you talking about a flap? Like, was there, was there... A UFO flap. Yeah, I thought there was like a flap on the wing of the UFO or something. Then I realized you're saying a flap flap, like people were in a flap. Right, Okay. exactly. I'm like, what is this? He saw, f- nobody else saw a flap, they just saw lights. <laughs> My writing was just crappy there, so, but anyway, uh, yeah. And it's an older term that a lot of people don't use recently, so. I, I use it still. You're making a flap. It might be a UK thing, but. Could be, yeah, yeah. Rutkowski continued writing that while most sightings in the Carmen event were distant nightlights, some witnesses described seeing close-up disc-shaped crafts with features like portholes. There were mentions of sky ferris wheels with slow-moving multicolored lights. 
reminiscent of scenes from the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, but predating its visuals. Although many of these accounts weren't reported to the RCMP and aren't in the NRC UFO files, being primarily in private collections, the officially noted ones do remain intriguing. The initial event that is believed to have triggered the Carmen series of Charlie sightings took place on March 27, 1975. This happened southeast of Graysville, Manitoba, roughly 12 kilometers from Carmen. In the middle of the night, around 2 a.m., a young girl was roused from her sleep by a piercing rhythmic siren. This was coupled with sensations similar to that of an earthquake. Shortly after, she saw a glowing red orb moving past her window in a southerly direction. The light was so intense that she believed her house was ablaze. Her impression was that the luminous object originated from the north and finally vanished toward the south, reminiscent of a sunrise. On April 11, 1975, Robert Diemert, 36, and his 29-year-old wife Elaine of Carmen spoke with Carmen RCMP Constable Nicholson, giving a detailed report about what they'd seen the night before. According to the RCMP documents, Edward said, quote, It was approximately 9.10 p.m. on the 10th of April, 1975. My wife and I were walking from our house down the road to the airport, Friendship Field, in Carmen. I remarked to my wife how clear the night was and how bright Venus was shining. It was a perfectly clear night with no clouds in the sky. My wife then remarked about a red light seen on the horizon coming over the trees. When I first saw it, I would estimate the distance to be about two miles to the west of us. Mrs. Demert advised that the aircraft was sure flying low. As we were walking down the road, the red light kept getting closer to us. Mrs. Demert thought that possibly it might have been a helicopter from Portage La Prairie as it was flying too low to be an aircraft. However, as we watched it draw closer, we could see that the aircraft was strangely lit up and that it appeared as though an aircraft were coming right at us with its entire wing leading edge lit up in red, with what would be fuselage lit up in red of a larger diameter. However, the aircraft was going by us to the east. As it approached closer, both my wife and I listened for sound, and there was absolutely no sound emanating from what was now thought to be an unidentified flying object. As it was going by us, we could see the light of the UFO pulsate slightly at times. It appeared to me as though the pulsation was caused by an atmospheric distortion by heat waves emanating from the UFO. This is only an opinion which might serve to explain the pulsation of the red light. When we watched the UFO for some five to seven minutes, it drew even with us, that is directly north of us, standing at the airport. The UFO then veered slightly to the north after proceeding east along the Provincial Trunk Highway 245 for approximately one mile." End quote. You know, out of all of that, the most interesting thing I find is that he calls his wife Mrs. Demert. That's sort of an older thing, too. I, I remember, you know... We never call their parents friends by their first names. Never. It was Mr. or Mrs. Always. Yes, absolutely. I still do that. So do I. I still do that. Like, a lady and I collided in a parking lot. <laughs> Essentially, I was backing out of a parking space, and she just stopped and laid on the horn instead of getting out of the way. <laughs> anyway, whole long story short, when we were dealing with each other, I called her Mrs. whatever her last name was. And I think she was impressed by that. You know, it's like, nobody does that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, it's what I do. That's how I was brought up. We, should start, it, we should start it again, Mr. Brown. We should, Mr. Stockton. I think <laughs> it, it would be a great idea. But I, I feel weird when somebody calls me Mr. or Sir. Well, actually, I had a friend that I hadn't... Someone called me ma'am once. Oh, God. I hadn't been in um, in contact with my friend's mom for a long time, and then she joined Facebook, and we were writing to each other, and I always referred to her as Mrs., right, with her last yep. name. She's yep. like, stop calling me that. I feel old. I'm like, it's all I ever knew you as, though. <laughs> like, yeah, I, it's I, I can't call you Helen, right? <laughs> yeah. The couple said the UFO seemed to move slightly northward across the highway before trailing along the road to the town's northern limits near the airport. Afterward, the UFO shifted its course, flying north to northeast at an approximate altitude of 300 feet. 
Using Provincial Trunk Highway number 245 as a reference, they estimated its distance from them to be about half a mile. Initially, the UFO was seen flying east, south of the highway, but it soon moved over to fly east, approximately half a mile north of the highway. From this distance, the UFO appeared to be around 50 feet long, slightly exceeding the wingspan of a small aircraft observed at the same distance. The only visible illumination was red, with no other navigational lights spotted. It gave the observer the feeling that the illumination wasn't actual lights, but a glow emanating from the UFO. Ultimately, the object was seen heading northeast and quickly vanished from sight, mainly due to its amazingly high flying altitude. As news of the Demert's first report made its way around the area via word of mouth and news reports, the UFO sightings around Carmen became more frequent. The Demert's continued to see saucer-shaped objects a few more times that year and were interviewed another time. Locals became so used to seeing lights in the sky that they joked about it, dubbing it Charlie Red Star. Of course, people were creeped out at first by the unexplained lights in the sky, but the frequency became such that a degree of comfort grew around them. Rutkowski said that on seeing the lights yet another time, one refrain went, Oh, there goes Charlie again. In 1975, the papers reported sightings across Canada, particularly on the prairies. It was a busy year for UFOs. While they had been centered around Manitoba, objects of eerily similar descriptions were seen around the same time frame across the country. Some around the same time involved alleged landings and even sightings of little people. The sightings were not confined to many local farmers and other residents. On May 11th and 12, 1975, the TV crew from CKY-TV went to Carmen but saw only a vague light. Despite initial skepticism, another attempt was made on May 13th when multiple groups tried different tactics to get closer to the UFO. Newspaper editor Howard Bennett and his group believed they nearly approached Charlie, describing it as a smoky red glow, likening its appearance to a slanted drive-in movie screen. Although they found potential radiation spots at the supposed landing site, the readings were inconclusive. Another group saw the UFO rising and falling before it darted towards a CBC tower. At the tower, CTV cameraman Alan Kerr filmed the object. This footage captured the UFO's erratic movements, but some considered parts of the film to be camera defects. The footage was later reviewed by prominent UFO expert Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who deemed it the best film of a nocturnal light he had seen. While this detailed account is not part of the official records, it provides a deeper understanding of the Carmen sightings. On May 13, 1975, at the RCMP detachment in Carmen, Constable Ian Lloyd Nicholson of the RCMP provided a statement regarding a UFO sighting near Carmen on May 9, 1975. He was the constable who earlier interviewed the Demerts. Nicholson described seeing an oval-shaped red light with an X-shaped background in the sky northwest of the airfield. The X-shaped light was white and was not attached to the red oval light. The object was flying northwesterly at an undetermined speed and an approximate altitude of 1,000 feet. He observed the object for around 12 minutes before it disappeared over the trees. Nicholson contacted the Portage La Prairie Rural Detachment to report the sighting. However, they later informed him that they hadn't observed any objects as described. Nicholson emphasized that the object made no noise. When asked if he had any additional information, Nicholson responded that he didn't believe there was anything more to add. The statement was signed, Constable I.L. Nicholson 30994 of the Carmen Detachment of the RCMP. During the summer in Carmen, three groups simultaneously witnessed an unexplained light moving across the sky, raising questions about its origins. Due to its singular red light, Bob Demert and others were convinced it wasn't an aircraft. As sightings of Charlie Red Star became more frequent, UFO watching turned into a local phenomenon. Media coverage exploded, attracting even the National Enquirer, Roads were congested with eager observers, leading to high-speed chases whenever the UFO appeared. 
While many sightings went unreported to the RCMP, there were notable incidents of a saucer-shaped UFO that summer, such as a daylight sighting near Holland, Manitoba. Mrs. Frederica Geisbrecht, a photographer, also captured images of an unexplained triangular light, which wasn't attributed to any known celestial body. Many locals began to personify Charlie, viewing it as a living entity, and the phenomenon inspired various artistic expressions. While sightings dwindled after 1975, with none in the NRC files from Carmen after that year, some residents believe Charlie might still be lurking. Calling everyone involved in these mass sightings liars would be ignorant and irresponsible. A good number of them saw something, but what was it? What was Charlie Redstar? In his detailed and fantastically researched book, Charlie Redstar, author Grant Cameron considers a possible nuclear connection. The relationship between UFO sightings and nuclear facilities and weapons has long been a topic of intrigue and debate within the UFO research community. Numerous reports of UFOs being sighted near nuclear power plants, research sites, and weapon storage areas across various countries have emerged. Particularly striking are claims from former military personnel, especially from the U.S. Air Force, who allege UFO interference with nuclear missiles, rendering them offline or non-responsive when UFOs were nearby. It's worth noting that the onset of the modern UFO era in the late 1940s coincided with the advent of the nuclear age, marked by atomic bomb tests and the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki shortly before the well-known Roswell incident in 1947. This temporal proximity has led some to speculate that extraterrestrial beings might be drawn or alerted by nuclear detonations. During the Cold War, superpowers, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, documented numerous UFO encounters near their nuclear establishments. One was in Britain, for example. It was a U.S. base that was scanned over a number of nights. I think it was three nights. At first, it was just a couple of enlisted men who saw it, security guys. But then, you know, the head of the base went out to debunk it, and he saw it too. So (laughs) it's quite fascinating. I wonder what it was anyway. Mike, unlike Mulder, (laughs) I don't need to believe (laughs) <laughs> but but what I Mulder says he wants to believe. He doesn't say he needs to. He says he wants to. But he acts like he needs to. But I focus my attention not on like the things themselves, but how people are regarding them, how they're talking about them, when they see them. I find that fascinating. Yeah. Right? Because you know, if you think about it, sightings started to ramp up during the invention of the nuclear bomb in the Cold War, like you're talking mm-hmm. about now. But I don't think it was necessarily that they were seeing physical Uh, military industrial complex things necessarily think about it humankind there was a menace for humankind like never seen before in history with the cold war and nuclear bombs sure and this must have had a huge psychological effect on the population and what happens when people like have these big psychological effects they create myths Mm -hmm. i'm not saying i don't believe these people i believe that they believe right and that's what i find fascinating one of my bros carl young carl young i love carl young he wrote a book in the 50s titled flying saucers a modern myth of things in the skies which actually talks about this and um you should read it i have the book so did you read it uh, I have read bits of it. I haven't read it fully through, but but yes, no, it's it's fascinating, and I love Jung, and and I understand what you're driving at. Yeah, and Jung actually wrote. He's like, it's almost a shame that they're real because the psychological things are are so interesting. So he yeah. actually he was actually like, yeah, they're real. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It, it, these people were seeing something. Mm-hmm. The question is, what are they seeing? Mm-hmm. How is it happening? So yeah, I'm with Jung. There is something going on, but what the heck is it? Yeah. While some researchers consider these to be misinterpretations of covert spy planes or military drills, others view these sightings as genuine unidentified phenomena. In some instances, these sightings even had international ramifications. For instance, in the 1980s, reports detailed unidentified craft invading Swedish airspace and hovering over nuclear sites, initially believed to be Soviet intrusions but later dismissed. Most governments, including the U.S., have traditionally downplayed such UFO sightings. Yet the consistent nature of these reports 
has led to conspiracy theories about potential cover-ups. Several hypotheses exist about this connection. Some postulate that extraterrestrial entities might be monitoring or expressing concern over humanity's nuclear endeavors. Others suggest these could be advanced reconnaissance technologies from rival nations. While some UFO-related files have been declassified, offering insights into these events, many remain undisclosed, further fueling speculation and intrigue. Ooh, intrigue. Uh, intrigue, yeah. Well, you know me, and I, a, a, a healthy dose of public distrust of governmental authority right. is, yes. is, is salient here. Yeah. Um, and I think whether or not you believe in aliens, the idea that um, some of it has been used as government propaganda is probably true. Mm -hmm. Maybe not all of it. Sort of like the government will dismiss it, but you know, they they kind of play with it. I think as well, right? They sort sure. of. Sure. I think sometimes when something that was seen that shouldn't have been, they might not. Um, totally dismiss when people are saying it's a ufo mm -hmm. and they're not they're not coming out and saying well it was the new stealth bomber right they're like oh we don't know what it was so right. so I, I think sort of playing on this idea of um aliens and ufos i think they've probably done that um but at this you know and jj abrams did like that 2021 ufo show documentary yep. but there's a new one on netflix that okay. steven spielberg just did so okay and he's saying m most of what we think is alien activity is probably our own technology in that show mm -hmm. and, and i think maybe collectively we have avoided discussing this and talk ufos instead of sort of confronting the idea that we have secret military military complex that that the government has and isn't isn't telling us because we don't like that so maybe we like attribute it to ufos well what's interesting about this is there are people in the government con uh, congress people senators who are saying something is going on that we are not aware of so the government is saying they are not aware of things that are going on. So uh, who's 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 calling the shots in that regard, you know? So so I kind of get what you're saying, but the government, this big G government doesn't seem to be aware of what's going on either. Well, or, some congress people don't, but they're just congress people, aren't they? What's just con Yeah, what is that? Like they're the, they're the lawmakers. Are they really, or is it business? Well, let's not even go down that hole. <laughs> but you, you know what you know what I'm saying. Yeah, it, but I'm like I'm sure that every Congress person doesn't know everything that the military or the CIA is up to. Right. That's my point. Right. Why not? Should we, they? We all should know. This is the thing, and that's what they're saying. We all should know. But we don't, and neither do they. So you, you go in, you have some more to say here. You're talking about meaningful criticism? No, it's fine. No, I want to know. Any meaningful criticism of the idea of UFOs as actually being our own tech is often dismissed as overly rational. Okay. By some people, right? Hey, so so it can be like, oh, there's conspiracy theorists, or it's like overly rational, right? Mm. But but we're not in a rational age, are we? <laughs> no. We're in the age of alternative facts and fake news and misinformation and deep fakes. So we we have a lack of reason, not an not an excess of it at the moment. And and I think the problems we face, you know, we, we, we need more rational thinking, not less of it. Um, we need more critical thinking yeah. is what we need. Well, yeah, that's what I mean by rational thinking. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, going back to your point here of nuclear bombs, was it stuff being tested? Well, you know, they're either real technologies being tested or their psychological needs being expressed because they see something they don't know or, or a combination of both. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But people are seeing things. They are seeing something. Like I'm I'm sure there's a few people that have created hoaxes for attention, but you know, when you have mass people seeing things, I don't think it's mass hysteria ever. I think people are seeing something that and and, and I'm not calling them liars, they're seeing something and some are attributing, you know, it's from space, others are attributing it's this, it's that, because they don't know.
According to Grant Cameron, UFOlogy researchers such as Robert Hastings have emphasized the close relationship between UFOs and nuclear missiles, with Hastings even writing a book titled UFOs and Nukes. In 1975, this connection was less acknowledged, even though sightings weren't isolated to Manitoba. Four U.S. states and Ontario had numerous UFO observations, coinciding with stories Grant Cameron was researching for the National Enquirer. Upon Cameron's return to Carmen almost 30 years after these events, he anticipated insights from the locals, but most were unwilling to talk except for Anthony Britton. Britton hinted at the presence of intercontinental ballistic missiles in nearby bases, suggesting a link between the UFO sightings in these nuclear facilities. Growing up in Winnipeg, Cameron was well aware of the U.S. bases in North Dakota and the looming threats posed by a potential nuclear confrontation between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Britain relayed a tale of a U.S. Air Force pilot who encountered an unidentified object near a missile silo. There were also accounts like Sandy Larson's alleged abduction near missile silos in North Dakota. In late August of 1975, Sandra Larson, her daughter, and her boyfriend had a mysterious encounter while traveling an I-94 toward Bismarck. About 45 miles out of Fargo, they saw 8 to 10 bright glowing orbs descending from the sky approaching them. Accompanied by a loud rumbling sound, the lights caused the trio to feel disoriented and stuck in their vehicle. When the sensation passed, Sandra found herself in the back seat with her daughter in the driver's seat. They realized an unaccounted hour had passed since the encounter. Psychologist R. Leo Sprinkle from the University of Wyoming investigated the case. Under hypnosis, Sandra revealed that she had been abducted and taken aboard an unfamiliar craft. She described undergoing strange medical procedures, including being probed and having a clear liquid applied to her body. A metal tool was used to scrape the inside of her nostril. The beings conducting these procedures resembled mummies with segmented metal rod-like arms. Over the years, Sandra's accounts faced skepticism, with some dismissing it as a hoax or the result of hallucination. However, the Sandra Larson incident influenced the scientific community's approach to such events, emphasizing the psychological impacts of trauma and perception. Narratives like Sandra's and others underscore the suspected connection between UFOs and nuclear arms. Ground light type objects were also reported both in Manitoba and near Wilton, reinforcing the notion that these occurrences might be interrelated. There's been more attention in the news around UFOs lately. I can't seem to escape it, and you probably can't either. Partly because it looks like the United States is getting ready to maybe declassify or disclose more information about UFOs. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer of New York and Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota spearheaded an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act aiming to mandate the disclosure of government records related to Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, UAP. This initiative, named the Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena Disclosure Act of 2023, draws inspiration from the President John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act of 1992. The goal is to establish a UAP records collection at the National Archives and Records Administration, with all records presumed for immediate release unless a review board provides reasons for classification. The motivation behind this legislation stems from numerous reports and stories about UAPs, leading some Congress members to suspect that the executive branch might be withholding significant UAP-related information. While the concealment might have been done with national security in mind, the lack of transparency is deemed unacceptable. The proposed legislation aims to ensure that the public is informed about the phenomena. The UAP records collection will be overseen by a UAP records review board, an independent agency responsible for deciding on the postponement of any records disclosure. The legislation also grants the federal government eminent domain over any recovered technologies of unknown origin and biological evidence of non-human intelligence held by private individuals or entities. The president retains the authority to overturn or concur with the review board's decisions. The UAP records must be fully disclosed and added to the collection within 25 years of the law's enactment. 
unless the president certifies that further postponement is essential for national security reasons. As we mentioned, the amendment mirrors the JFK Assassination Records Collection Act, which mandated the public release of Kennedy assassination documents within 25 years of the act's passage. And some of that still hasn't happened. Anyway, things are moving forward. There have since been congressional UFO hearings in the U.S. and other countries, especially in South and Central America. People have made wild claims under oath about seeing technology they say is not man-made or even non-human biologics, which could mean almost anything, collected from crashed craft. In a recent Mexican congressional hearing, alleged alien bodies originating from Peru, claiming they're a thousand years old, were presented as possible aliens. The bodies look ridiculous, like a child's paper mache project. You have to have seen the memes, you know, especially the one where someone makes the alien into cake and then cuts its head. Some of these are hilarious. So you're aware of these uh, alien bodies that were presented to the Mexican Congress, correct? Yeah, and and I wonder why the Congress of Mexico even had them there in front of them. Well, yeah, and the guy, Jaime Mossan, who was the one who presented them to them, has a history of presenting things as alien life forms, and then they are de- debunked. Uh, well, like, why would it have, uh, what I don't, what I find interesting about that story is how it got that far. Right. The worst Canada does is get an ex-Nazi in and give him a standing ovation. Yeah. <laughs> Which was a total embarrassment, right? Didn't catch it, right? Somebody didn't do the research on this guy, but like such a fake alien being presented to Congress is is just totally irrational. According to the da- the Daily Express in the UK on express.co.uk, unearthed a- this is just yesterday. Mm. Unearthed alien bodies in Mexico are real, and retired expert claims he has proof. Uh, and they exclusively interviewed this Cliff Miles about it, and he said, "Oh yeah, I undid the the dust and stuff, and these things." have skin and it's real her skin is complete and intact for her entire body no seams no scars no way to create a fake of any kind she is sound he says if there is a scar it's under her medical device that is on her chest this weird thing that looks like headphones and she's had her clavicle operated on and the reason he's calling it a she is because this thing appears Uh, under x-ray and ultrasound cat scans all that they've done appears to have eggs inside inside of her okay (laughs) so (laughs) i i can't do this with a straight face anymore Line in the Express's headline, I, I can't see the one you're reading, but this is sort of like you said is real. They they probably have quotes around that quotation marks even in the headline, and what they what no the, they have unearthed alien bodies in quotation marks, <laughs> okay. and then our real is not, which okay. is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny, man. So. Oh, boy. I I just, it's so strange. I think that was one of the strangest stories of this year. Yeah. Is that. Well, you know, the year's not over yet. It's like uh, Morgan and I were talking about it, you know. Uh, We saw the U.S. congressional hearings, and that was really weird. All the stuff that David Grush was talking about, you know, alien biologics, like I mentioned. And, but it's then like the Mexican hearing said, wait a minute. Hold my beer. Here's <laughs> here's something a little weirder. But g- get this. In December, there is going to be another Mexican congressional hearing about this particular uh, uh thing. And it may be it may be to follow up on the alien body claims. I'm just saying, I think it may be just to like so they don't look like Idiots. complete idiots and bumholes here uh it might be that's why they're following up anyway I, I hope so i think the mexican congress has a lot of work in front of them mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> you know i think i think they should probably put this to to bed and, and get on with things that matter to the people <laughs> yeah they've got bigger fish to fry down there yeah 
Well, I like to think about these things, though. To quote the poster from Fox Mulder's cubicle, I want to believe. So, I don't know. I've got the poster behind me right now, so. I know your poster. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, well. And that's it for Dark Poutine, episode 289, Spooktober. More on Canadian UFOs and the Charlie Red Star sightings. Fun. Are they Canadian UFOs or are they space? Well, there there's some Canadian ones that I mentioned. <laughs> UFOs with little with little uh, maple maple leaves on them. Well, they we, happen we, we in come Canada. From, we come from an alternate universe called hey, Canada. We come from an alternate <laughs> universe, eh? We're here to 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 uh, assimilate you hosers. <laughs> Can you imagine can, can, Canadian aliens? So Canadian funny. aliens, eh? So, yeah, we're here. Would it be okay? Because I'm polite, eh? Would it be okay if I probed your bum, eh? <laughs> we're so sorry for uh, entering sorry. your atmosphere. Sorry I had to enter your atmosphere. But, you know, <laughs> like we're here doing the thing, eh? Is, the, is there blood made out of like Molson Canadian beer or something? No, maple syrup. Okay. Yeah, the beer is the fuel. Uh, okay. Yeah, we, beer, we, well, it was always my fuel when I was traveling to alien worlds. <laughs> that and pot. Oh, that too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's look at some voicemail. I think you want to believe. I do. I do. You like to play with this. Because you know, I'm getting to know you, you like to provoke and you're like, oh, here's the problem with what you're saying, Matthew. It's like, well, that's not a problem. It's just a, another opinion. But you like to play with it. You want them to be real. Sure. They'd be your buddies. They, well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, yeah, hopefully it wouldn't be uh, uh, unsolicited probings. <laughs> like, I have to say yes. Well, they've stopped doing the probings anyway. After after decades of doing it, Mike, all all they of all the research of anal probes, all they figured out was one in ten people like it. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> and that is it for Dark Poutine episode two hundred and eighty nine, Spooktober three. More on Canadian UFOs and the Charlie Red Star sightings. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. So we have two voicemails this week. Uh, Looks like we almost had three. Someone from a 604 number called on Tuesday and left a two-second voicemail, so I'm just not going to play that. But anyway, I thought that was kind of fun. Um, But yeah, let's listen to our first voicemail. That's a great message. Good morning from the Maritime. My name is Ashley. I'm a longtime listener and first-time caller and proud Yumber Yarder. I started listening in 2019 and felt connected right away as I live in BC and have just visited Nova Scotia for the first time that year. I never had a great reason to call, but I'm back in the Maritime, so it seemed like the best time to tell you guys how I appreciate your show, your content, and your humor. I hope your hometown wasn't hit too hard by the recent hurricane. We spent... Uh, some time last week in Cheswick Cook in Eastern Passage before traveling to PEI to meet up with friends. And now we've been in New Brunswick for a week being touristy and attending a conference in a lot of locations across the province. I will say as much as I love the West Coast, the history and the pace of life here has been really amazing. And I wish that I could take that home with me. So I suppose this voicemail is a little uh, homage to the variety that exists in Canada. Keep up the good work on the show and the books. I'm looking forward to the next one. And don't forget to take a shit in your hat. Well, there you go. I'm looking forward to my next book, too. And thank you for calling us while you were back in my home stomping grounds. Yeah, they uh, Bridgewater survived the hurricane pretty, pretty well. It, the more recent flooding was <laughs> was probably a little more... Uh, 
dangerous for people and and did more damage. But uh, yeah, Dad said, "Oh, I just tied the tied my my boat to the side of the apartment, and everything was fine." And what he meant by that is he lives on the fourth floor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how high the water was. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, he was kidding. Anyway. I hope so. Yeah. But, uh, oh, wow. So Ashley is uh, from BC, visiting back east. What do you think she does, um, Matthew? Because I'm curious, you know, what facilitates going to a convention in various places back in uh, the Maritimes. It's interesting. What is she learning back there, and what business does she do? You know, I was actually thinking that Canada should have provincial ambassadors to other provinces. Okay. So she's the BC ambassador. Okay. That's be, cool. Yeah. It, so wouldn't she's. That be, wouldn't that be fun having ambassadors? <laughs> like, so, so in BC, we'd have like a Quebec ambassador, you know, an Ontario ambassador, et cetera. It'd be interesting. She's an ambassador, BC cool. ambassador for the, for all of the Atlantic provinces. They probably have those things and we just don't know about it. Okay. Well, let's listen to our next voicemail. I don't know where this person is calling from, but let's have a listen. Hi, guys. My name's April. I'm calling from London, Ontario. Um, I did call you guys uh, quite a few months ago now, and I've been listening for, to the podcast a bit longer, and I feel a little ignorant from the last time I called in because I was not up to date on all the episodes. I was pretty new listener. I had no idea that you guys were familiar with the area. And now I feel like my first voicemail was kind of silly, but I'm still really enjoying the show. I'm slowly dwindling down on episodes to listen to. So I'm uh, really looking forward to you guys releasing more episodes. Um, you guys are great. Um, I'm in my fourth year of nursing school. I'm actually in my last placement. Um, just sitting in my driveway after a night shift, really tired, not even wanting to get out of my car, but you guys um, accompany me on my commute every day. I'm doing my placement in Woodstock, so um, I usually try and get an episode in on my way there and back. So thank you for giving me something entertaining to listen to on my drives and giving me something to kind of relax to after long days of nursing school and uh you know, you guys have really helped me get through and, you know, you are so open about life struggles and mental health challenges and especially as men. I think that's so fantastic and so great and uh, you guys are just doing a really awesome job with the show. So once I'm done school, I plan on becoming a uh, Patreon and giving you guys some donut money so you can look forward to that. Anyways, go take a poop in your toque and have a great day. Bye, guys. There you go, a nurse. Wow, that's those those people work hard. Well, Nurses and, work hard, and that's. Uh, I mean, it's a doable drive, but a drive to Woodstock and back every day for work it would really add some time to your day. So, well, perfect time to listen to Dark Poutine, as she's <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was going to give her a profession, knowing London, Ontario, but she's given it to us already. So, yeah. She, well, she's a nurse. What type of nursing, perhaps, Matthew, is she getting into? Because she I was, need a psychological she, nurse, a psych she, nurse. <laughs> she she went to the Grand Theater in London. Mm-hmm. And she was amazed by the perineum arch yep. that, that we spoke about before. Right, yep. So I think she's a perineum nurse specialist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. She's well, specialist. And that job is taint for the, for the faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> taint for the faint of heart. No. Oh, it's it's sort of it, I she's crack, I cracked me up. It's 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 a job for people who are in between other jobs. <laughs> so thank you so much for looking after our perineums. Yeah. Well, she said uh, more episodes. She's looking forward to more episodes. We've done two hundred and eighty nine. This is this is two hundred and eighty nine. People, like people are not voracious. It's not like a, Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um 
Yeah, I I was thinking, what a great voicemail. Thank you very much for uh, all your compliments and that kind of stuff. Because, like, I was looking at, I accidentally clicked on a link and looked at some of our reviews. (laughs) And people don't like that the show is becoming more woke. It's it's because, good. If, If this show upsets you in the things that we talk about, that's the intent. My intent is to upset the apple cart. It's to push buttons and make people think about things that maybe they haven't thought about before. I am, I'm, if you look it up, I'm an INFP, which is an advocate. Uh, That is my Briggs, uh, whatever, Myers-Briggs personality type. I don't know what yours. I'm totally the opposite of you. Oh, okay. But anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm ENTJ, the commander. Oh yes, you're you're a you're the Nazis. <laughs> no, Margaret, no, Margaret Thatcher was one. Oh well, that explains everything. <laughs> Old Maggie Iron Shorts. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, hey, and I'm, you, I'm you, in. You've seen that in me though as well, haven't you? I I <laughs> have. I <laughs> have. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like so, people are. If you find it in your heart to go and give us a five-star review somewhere uh, where it's possible, that would be much appreciated. It's always interesting that the people who leave crappy reviews, like bring back he who shall not be named, because probably they don't know what a, uh, a not a nice person he actually was, um, they always make their username 55327764BB83. You know, it's like so, keyboard warriors, you know, email me, email me so I can have a discussion with you. Mm. Something, an actual discussion about um, how wrong you are. <laughs> 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 nah, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, yeah, not. so the, no, I, you know, you know, I won't respond. That's the thing because I don't like to fight with people. I just don't. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 327 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. It's time for Patreon, our Patreon folks. And first up, at our eager beaver tier, is Josh Peters. And Josh decided to opt out of receiving benefits by mail, which is sad, because I would like to send some stickers and stuff. But... Come on, Josh. We yeah, want to exactly. Be, we want to where, be friends, friends with benefits. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so where is Josh Peters from, Matthew? Where is he from? And what Brooke, does he do? Brooklyn, don't do the accent. Okay, I won't. <laughs> because he's a transplant to Brooklyn. Okay. He's originally from Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, he lived near Cedar Point, Ohio, Ohio the amusement park. Okay. And he's setting up an amusement park in Brooklyn. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Wow. Well, there you go. He's doing a water slide off the Brooklyn Bridge. Whew. That could end badly for it, somebody. Or it'd be really fun. Really fun. Sure. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't, I'm not big on heights, so uh, I wouldn't like to. Unless the, the little slide goes right into the river. But of course, I don't want to go into the Hudson River either. I've heard bad things. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've heard bad things. But uh, okay, so thank you, Josh. Much appreciated, Josh Peters. Yeah, in Brooklyn, a transplanted Ohioan from who now lives in Brooklyn and is building a big water slide. <laughs> this show's ridiculous sometimes. It is. Next, we have. Lisa Skyheart from Lisa Skyheart Martial Art, and not martial arts, but martial with uh, A-R-S-H-A-L-L, begins with a capital M. So Lisa Skyheart Martial Art says, donut money for Mike and Matthew because everyone needs donuts once in a while. And it's true, I 
need donuts every now and again. We have a new Lee's Donuts location here in Langley at Willowbrook Mall, and I went and got myself some wonderful Lee's Donuts. And one day, <laughs> one day when I knew I sort of had to get back to my uh, good food regimen, my mm. entire day of uh, calories was donuts. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So I I ate <laughs> the only thing I ate that day was donuts and coffee. <laughs> that's donuts. not that's not healthy. That was not healthy. That was one day, and so that's when I realized, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so what kind of art does Lisa Mar- Skyheart Martial Art do, Matthew? I know what kind it is because she uh, has given us stuff before and i know where she's from where is she from she's from ojai california and her art is fantastic so oh hi we- oh hi oh hi <laughs> lisa skyheart martial art original paintings if you google that or just go to skyheartart.com you can uh learn a little bit about what she does and she does like really cool things like the main picture she has on her website uh it has like dragonflies and and bees and flowers and feathers it's really really nice they're really nice paintings they they soothe me to look at that kind of stuff so thank you lisa i like the birds uh, yeah it's all nice i mm. think she does a great stuff and she even has exhibits and events. Her crow uh, theory of reciprocity crow painting mm. is really, really cool. And it, it, it's a crow standing on uh, a bit of a, a landscape. But it has all kinds of interesting things that look like things you might find laying around, like a thimble and a key, a paper clip, a bunch of paper clips. Yeah, it's I- kind of fun. A I roach to, clip. <laughs> uh, I want her to call in and tell me where this the Dutch house and Blue Eyed Crow, where the Dutch house is. Okay. Well, yeah, Lisa, give us a call and talk to us about that because talk we're to interested. me about the Dutch house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, thank you both for your patronage and for your donut money. Thank we you. We really appreciate it. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening, and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that is it for this episode of Dark Poutine. So until next time, keep looking at the skies. And don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. (laughs) Oh, dear. said to my parents, don't trust her, I wouldn't listen. Every family has a secret. Joy Delaney, mother of four, has gone missing. From the author of Big Little Lies comes a chilling new mystery to W. You were an emotional chaos sinkhole, Amy, and I'm sick of it! 
starring Annette Bening. Nobody can break your heart like your own children. And Sam Neill. She will come back. Here we go. Strap in. Apples never fall. All new Thursdays, only on W. Stream on Stack TV.